Welcome to part 12 of our Neuro Affirming series. I'm Eveline from Awesome Training and um, thank you all for joining me. Um, it's turning out to be a really lovely series and I'm delighted to have everybody along this week. So um, we are taking some of the activities from my books and we're talking about you know, why they're in there, uh, how beneficial they are to you, whether you're a parent or a professional or a teacher or somebody working in school using these and also to the child because obviously our work is very child focused. Um, so last week we had, and if you don't have the books, don't worry, you can just follow along anyway and make note of the activities. Um, last week we talked about yes and let's, and if you've missed any of the series, you can check it out on YouTube. Yes and let's, which was a lovely activity um, that, you know, people always have fun with, uh, accepting someone else's idea. So what I'm going to do this week is just move on a little bit in the book to a part of the last part, well, one of the last page 22, we're talking about standing up for myself. Um, which is obviously a theme I develop later in my book, which is called Standing Up For Myself, funnily enough. So um, I start off by saying, let's be honest, it's very difficult for kids sometimes to stand up for themselves unless grown-ups are good listeners. So if you're a grown-up using this book, it might be a good idea to, uh, to see how well you listen to kids when they assert themselves. You can do all the advocating in the world if people aren't taking notice. No point, is there? Some grown-ups are very quick to call self-advocacy defiance. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the people who are here are joining us along on our neuroaffirming journey, but maybe people who aren't on the neuroaffirming journey see advocacy as defiance. And that's very common, isn't it? This can happen to grown-ups because it happened to them as kids and they forget what it's like to be dismissed. This is an example of how we can listen to our own stories instead of the stories that have been told to us. And that's referring to my introduction to the book, why we don't believe what actually happens in our own heads and hearts and why we're believing the stories that are told to us. Um, and then we talk about the different ways to self-advocate. So what we're going to look at is I've included them this week. We go, you know, we talk about how we can use the exercise we did, yes and let's, to help us maybe to self-advocate because I, I think it might be the way we communicate. Sometimes if someone says like an absolute to us, we, we just accept it. We're, you know, it's hard maybe for us to question it. Um, or maybe we take it as truth, particularly if we're little. There's definitely something there worth exploring. So sometimes, you know, if you ask for something and someone says, you know, gives you an absolute answer, it kind of finishes the conversation a bit. Ooh, that happens with everybody actually, doesn't it? Um, so maybe how to help a child to kind of work around that using yes and let's. So for example, we can, uh, we can, if you tell someone that you need a break uh, and they reply by saying, break time is in 10 minutes. <clears throat> it can be hard to know what to do to that kind of absolute response. You can reply saying, yes. And let's say I wait another 10 minutes when I need a break right now. What might happen then? So I suppose you're, you're teaching the kid to use yes and let's in a clever way. Well, accept what person's saying. But, you know, and, and let's see what happens if this might happen. So, you know, if, 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 if we don't, if you don't give me the break, or you might say that the lights are too bright and the other person might reply, they're not too bright for me. So how can you use yes and let's here? You could reply and say, yes. And let's remember that your experience is not the same as mine. Or yes, and let's understand that I am more sensitive to light than others because they're big ones. They're biggies, aren't they? Where people... We um, base our sensitivities on their own experiences. So, you know, this is a really helpful one for kids to have and also adults, <laughs> helpful to all of us. And then you're going to ask them, how can you think of other situations where you can use yes and let's? So, you know, work out with them things that have happened in the past, how they could have used yes and let's and come up with some imaginary scenarios of how they could use them in the future. So um, that has been some of the activities in Connect 2. I hope you've enjoyed them and I hope you're finding the series helpful. Um, let me know in the comments and if you find this help, helpful, you know, share them with other people who might also, also like to learn. Um, so thanks again for joining me and we'll see you next week.